It's my pleasure to welcome another guest, a uh, guest who is uh, not typical for this channel because uh, mostly we have enhanced people, so to speak. And uh, this time I wanted to invite someone who uh, is going to show you how important in prep is, first of all, patience, and second of all, being really smart. And uh, when it comes to the uh, enhancements, they are the same thing uh, when it comes to being a natural. You're, you're doing the prep as a natural, just with uh, extra creatine, so to speak. AJ Morris, introduce yourself, mate. Thanks very much for having me. I really appreciate it, dude. And especially considering who you normally have on the podcast, it's nice to, it's nice to be uh, an addition that can hopefully provide some context to some of your other listeners and maybe also drag some, some natural guys to listen to your podcast in the future as well. Um, so a little bit of an introduction on myself. So I'm 24 years old. Uh, I've been competing ever since I was 18 and I, I've competed always in, in drug-free federations uh, in the UK here. We have two main ones they're the BNBF and the UK DFBA um, and they lead up to, you know, pro classes as well within the natural scene. And as much as it's a smaller scene, there are some you know, bigger names that have come through, especially the federation that I want to compete in, which is the WNBF in the future. Like I've had Sean Clarida come through the WNBF, even Kai Green was a WNBF pro at uh, and 19 years old. He was one of the youngest WNBF pros ever. And yeah, so that's sort of my section of the sport in terms of my competitive endeavors. And then from a coaching perspective, uh, I coach full time, all online, no one to one stuff. And that's what I've been doing since, since 2015. And that primarily focuses on the drug free athlete and taking them to the stage or taking them through their off seasons, etc. And my, my goal really is very similar to sort of how Cuba has his goals aligned with with his coaching business is to just coach the very high level elite athletes, um, turn people pro, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, that's what I'm, I'm definitely getting closer towards now uh, with recent years. And uh, other than that, like right now, I'm nine weeks out from my first show this season. So just competing one week after Cuba's first show. And uh, yeah, if, if anyone doesn't sort of know like already, but I train with Cuba every day, he's my training partner. So I'm very, very grateful for that. And uh, yes, um, it's been a very, really, really good prep so far. So hopefully we can get into some of the details. When it comes to uh, your relationship with Kuba, is it a more like friendly one or is he some kind of a coach uh, figure to you? Sure. So uh, our first sort of baseline of our relationship was, was a friendship. Um, and it's definitely always going to be a, uh, there's always going to be a friendship there, even if he is sort of, looking over me and, and sort of coaching me in some shape or form. But the way that I see sort of us working together is Cuba sort of a bit of a second eye for me. So for context, I've always prepped myself that the only prep that I've ever done with a coach was in 2014. And I did my own prep in 15 and uh, 17 as well. Um, I always like calling the shots and just being the one that basically messes it up if, if I mess it up. Um, and I don't like to have to ever, ever like think about placing blame or anything like that on anyone else. Like I'd rather take the heat myself. So, but to have Cuba in my corner at the moment is just, well, the thing is it just works so nicely because we train together each day. We chat every day and he sees me every time post-workout. It was inevitable that at some point he would have some sort of a role. And uh, so at the moment, the way it works is I sort of just, I'll tell him what I'm thinking and then he'll either back it up or say something different. And then I'll tell him what I'm planning to do. And then he'll either agree or say something slightly different. And then we'll just work to a happy medium. Um, so it, it works fantastically well. It's probably the best setup that I've ever had in my life for a prep. Um, because it just allows me to have someone who's got such a great eye for bodybuilding. Um, but is also understands me on like a, you know, a friendship level, which means he understands me more in terms of how I work uh, emotionally as well as some of my decision making emotionally, um, which makes it, yeah, bang on. So um, that's sort of the relationship we have more of a friendship, but definitely he's there as a, as a coach to a degree as well. Yeah, this time when I'm being prepped by Cuba, uh, I'm as well um, more like, you know, I'm shutting the hell up and letting him do the work because yeah. this time I don't want to mess it. I, I don't have the cold eye when it comes to the prepping, you know, I, I tend to uh, speed the things up and so on, which is, which yeah. we will speak about uh, uh, soon. Uh, I mean, uh, in the 
next part of the interview or the conversation. Uh, but you spoke already about coaching, you yourself being a coach. And yeah. do you coach as well the enhanced people or only focus on the naturals? I do have a few enhanced clients, but the only ones that are enhanced are people that were previously natural and then we formed like such a good sort of coach client relationship and partnership that they don't really want to go anywhere else for the coaching for the training for the nutrition so with the enhancement i usually just well in the past i'd have them consult with um some people that i trust but now pretty much what i do is i'll just they'll tell me what they're running and then i'll just run it by cuba and then cuba's sort of educating me on on how to make decisions and how to sort of improve my knowledge there because my knowledge without you know beating around the bush is very very minimal on on performance enhancing drugs i don't have any 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 knowledge on on the topic really um or at least i didn't have that six months ago but now i have a greater understanding as to the basics and ensuring that people are doing things safely and then i can just any any other questions or queries that i have i can run by cuba so um and the people that do decide to go down that route, most of them are already very sensible and clued up and well-trained. Well, all of them are well-trained, sensible individuals. So they, they have made that, that decision whilst doing their own research as well. So they're not just people coming to me saying, oh, I, you know, I want to use gear. Can you coach me? They're people that have trained for half a decade, a decade naturally. And then they want to take that next step. So they're already nailing everything else. They just got to, you know, for their goals, they want to go assisted. So I have three clients like that. Um, I also have some clients that uh, run TRT dosages, but that's for health reasons more than anything else. And they don't plan on increasing those. So, um, but yeah, primarily naturals, mate. You started with uh, the uh, TRT and so on. What does it mean to be a natural? Do you, would you consider someone who is taking a TRT still a natural person because he's taking it for a health reason? Or would we uh, still be uh, able to put them in the same corner as, for example, me, who is, you know, abusing <laughs> stuff, not to yeah. lie? Obviously, there's levels to this, this game, you know, it's very clear with the amount of, of, you know, muscle you can build when you really, really chase the maximum level of performance enhancing drugs that you can use based on your body and your biofeedback. But I think I would consider someone on TRT still natural because if they're in physiological ranges, they're still natural. But so that, let's say they take TRT to come away from like a hypogonadal state or something, you know, and they're, they're just going into non super physiological ranges, then that's still natural in my opinion, but they would not be able to compete in natural shows. Um, even if they took a testosterone reading and showed it to the, the, the Federation, it's still not enough. You're not allowed to use even a TRT dose. Um, and if you did use a TRT dose, most federations, um, you'd either have to have like a doctor's note as a reason, like a true reason as to why you are on TRT. Um, so it couldn't like, you'd have to have that or you'd have to have the doctor's note and have a reason why you've come away from it as well which not many people do if you go on to trt it's very likely you're on trt for the rest of your life um it's very unusual that you would come away from that so that's unusual um but i have one friend that actually did use a form of testosterone replacement therapy it wasn't injectable um but a form of testosterone replacement therapy after he had an accident um, just to basically bring his body back to baseline and see if he could recover his own endogenous production. And he did eventually recover some production and he still had to wait seven years to compete in the drug free fed. So, I mean, mate, there's some crazy rules in terms of natural bodybuilding and it does put a lot of people off. It even sometimes puts me off. Like there's certain pre-workouts I can't have. There's certain supplements I can't have, you know, it's, it's run by most federations, the water drug testing. And, you know, like as an athlete, when you're under that stringent rules, you've got to really be mindful of everything you take. So um, it's a bit of a minefield really, but yeah, I would consider them still natural, but the federations don't. The federation that you compete have, uh, of course, the tests before you uh, go on the stage. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They do have the tests. So do they have the random tests as well. Like uh, in the middle of the season, they can come to you and uh, have you checked. 
when I'm professional, probably, but not not for an not for an amateur athlete, no. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's people that try and get away with doing stuff. I'm I'm of confident of it, but normally you can tell whether like you can really tell whether someone's really trying to to cheat the book but in the in the instance of the the test that we have so the urine analysis and the the polygraph the the polygraph is almost definitely just a deterrent it's something that scares people away a little bit and makes them think oh okay maybe i won't do it um and i mean i don't know what goes through people's heads to try and think that they're going to try and compete in a drug free right if you want to compete and you're assisted just go and compete in assisted federations there there's so there's so many non-tested feds out there that you've got plenty of room to compete if you need to compete um and then uh the urine analysis obviously there's you know i'm sure there's i'm sure there's ways to get around having some performance enhancing drugs in your system i'm sure there's ways because you know, like when I've mentioned it to anyone, they've always said, oh, but it can get out of your system and stuff like that. So, you know, th- these things are just as good as they can be. Um, unfortunately, we're not, you know, natural bodybuilding is not the Olympic Games and it's not, you know, the Tour de France. But even when you think about the Olympic Games or Tour de France, or whatever, Lance Armstrong still managed to cheat for however many years. So even at the highest of levels, when there's, off- when there's drug testing completely randomly, when there's drug testing all throughout the events, people can still cheat. So I don't, know you, uh, I don't know if you have read the Mike Tyson's book, but he I spoke so. about his uh, tests when he was, he, he spoke about it that uh, he once failed the marijuana one because he forgot his fake pen, penis. You know, they were t- t- testing him like, Mike, go and have a pee, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you done it? Yeah, and probably he was, you know, uh, cracked out of his mind and just forgot to, you know, yeah. bring it yeah. with him. Because wow. they are informed. Uh, you know, it's just too much cash in uh, uh, to lose for the federation, for the sponsors and so on. Yeah. So yeah. Let, uh, an athlete like Mike Tyson or someone uh, just get screwed like this, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, tell me about it. You know, not, not many people would have the time or the money to put into crazy stringent drug, drug testing um, i mean even even the polygraphs and the urine analysis cost enough and a lot of the time especially for the polys you have to pay as an athlete you have to pay your way to be drug tested so um yeah it's just not enough money in it at the moment everyone speaks about their uh, genetic potential and so on you know their natural genetic potential and uh, yes. what can be achieved as a natural athlete in uh, your uh, physique because you know there are always I've, I've read your post and you yourself said that there are things that you have changed and was still able to improve even though doing it after uh, six seven years which most of people are saying that after five or six years you're not able to progress anymore uh, like barely at all so yes. uh, what are the steps that you can move forward to even improve your uh, sure. So I think as you evolve as an athlete, like whether you're natural or assisted, you just adapt your processes to not only what works for you, but what you've learned and the knowledge that you've built. And as a result of that, you'll always find sort of little things to step forwards and progress with. So for me, I think realistically the, the biggest changes that have happened over the last sort of half a decade has been with training and the thing is training like i've just mentioned is a complete process of evolving in terms of your ability to train so i'm a big believer that you can always train harder and you can always train more accurately and that is something that if you keep pushing forwards towards and you keep developing that understanding and awareness as to how you can train harder and better and more accurately then you're always going to have a little bit of room for improvement and you're always going to be able to step it up a gear. So in my next off season, when I can train even harder than I can train now, I'll be able to step it up another gear. I'm confident of that, very confident of that. And I think people get way too complacent with training, way too complacent. And they try and find the easy way out, the easy route or the comfortable way to train. And me and Cuba say it so fucking often. We, we say to each other on rest days that we're just completely smashed. And we say to each other after a pool day, 
or a leg day when we've been in the gym for three, three and a half hours. This is, this is long. And I'm like, yes, but it's fucking meant to be like anyone, anyone that's a high level athlete. Do you think that it's easy to like, you know, get the best hundred meter time? Or do you think it's easy to, you know, run a marathon at the record pace? No, it's fucking not. It's brutally hard. So bodybuilding is meant to be the same in my opinion. There's elements that are definitely meant to be made easier and like elements of the prep that are meant to be not so hard to bring your best physique. But I think the training section or side of things should always be something that really, really challenges you. Um, because if it's not, let's face it, like what, what are you actually going to adapt to when it's not challenging? And when you're finding yourself in this perfect fatigue, non-fatigue state and you don't get angry for your sessions because that's too much fatigue and, you know, this boring way of bodybuilding that people seem to be falling into now, um, that in my opinion just, just doesn't yield as good results. So if you want slower, if you want textbook results, which by textbook, I mean like, you know, the one pound of muscle that you're meant to build a year as a natural, then go ahead and train like the people in the research studies and just do that. And if you're happy doing that and you're happy seeing next to no changes in your physique year to year, then go for it. But I, I never want that. I never wanted that. And that's why I feel pretty significant improvements to, to my physique over the course of a two year phase off. So Hopefully that answers your, your question on that side of things. Yeah, I saw your uh, transformation and you were like 150 uh, before and now you are 170, you are 152 weeks uh, pre-competing and now, yeah. you're, now you are, uh, sorry, I need to, I can't see you for a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think now it's going to be better. Got it? Wait. Okay, sorry, a little uh, technical difficulties, and uh, I was uh, speaking about your progress because you was uh, you said about this one pound per year. That's uh, what uh, studies say, and you yourself were made, uh, were I was able to progress like five pounds per year because uh, you are now like one seventy somewhere uh, close to this, and uh, with pretty much the same conditioning as you were two weeks before last your last. Uh, competing seasons yeah. uh in uh two weeks before yeah so that's yeah. so i think that's just testament to everything that i've just said about the training side of things and uh, over the whole off season the the training just kept leveling up um i think i could have actually gained more than that to be honest i think i could have gained another five pounds of muscle if i'd have been training with cuba from straight like straight from the start because my life's very very different to what it was like back then in 2017 you know i was living with my parents i was training in a gym which i was like one of the strongest people in it you know and that's not good um like the the levels that i've now saw the the change that i made in my life have all been around not just bodybuilding for me but bodybuilding for my business as well just surrounding myself with people that make me feel like i want to level up and make me feel like i can do better or do more or progress in this shape or form so those are all the changes that i've made and i think that's showing in not only my physique but my business too so um i think i talk about it a lot and you know if you surround yourself with people that are like-minded towards the approach of gaining one pound of muscle a year then you will guarantee yourself you will only gain one pound of muscle a year as a natural because that's all that you think is possible whereas if you surround yourself like i'm surrounding myself with a fucking ifbb pro you know so if i'm trying to compete or or keep up with this person in the gym and if i'm trying to have relative strength drop-offs or relative strength retention during a diet as him then i'm going to i think get a way better result than I would if there was two naturals that just kept complaining about losing strength throughout a prep training together. Like I wouldn't change my training partner for the world because if I can keep up with him when he changes his cycle a little bit, then uh, I'm holding on to more muscle, you know? Um, and uh, I think that that's uh, that like, it just shows the power of the mind because right now I, I've lost strength on like a little bit of things. Like a few, few of my presses have come down. But that's to be expected. I've lost 30 pounds of body weight so far. Um, but I am about seven to eight pounds away from stage condition and I haven't dropped off any leg performance. 
my RDLs are only 10 kilos off off season bests um, for the same reps. And yeah, I've never retained this. And my rows are even stronger than they were in the off season. I've never retained this amount of strength ever in a diet. And I didn't even think it was feasible, but I've just set the ceiling or had the ceiling set, sorry, by, by someone else. And I'm just watching him do what he does. And I'm thinking, well, I better go and do that too. So um, the environment that you're in is so important for your your idea of your potential and where you set the limits, especially as a natural, for sure. Uh, so when speaking about uh, off season, because we of course know that uh, a natural person shouldn't be cutting this often, because yeah. that's just not worth it if you want to have a progress uh, because the, of the hormones and so on. Uh, yeah. How long should the off season uh, last and uh how should you approach the off season so i personally think you should definitely take at least a year between between two preps um if you're planning to to compete back to back years as a natural you should be prepared to understand that your six month phase between the two preps perhaps or four or five months whatever should be extremely meticulous towards uh managing the fatigue that you've created throughout the diet and also bringing yourself from a physiological perspective back up to to where you need to be um and that would involve blood work too so um if you weren't able to get back to like so if i wasn't able to get back to where i was at, at the end of my last off season in terms of from a testosterone and a hormonal perspective uh by the end of like a five or a six month off season at the end of this prep, then I wouldn't compete really in 2021. And if I didn't feel ready as well, I wouldn't do it. Um, and then I think from a making improvements standpoint, I think you can make great improvements as a natural in a relatively short period of time. If you're a younger trainee or if you're newer to, to competing itself. Um, and I also think you can make pretty quick progress if you recover from your prep really well, um, because you're in a really good spot to grow. If you, manage the fatigue quick and you get back to a good range physiologically quick but not a lot of people do that either they do one of two things so most naturals well not most naturals but it's like a 50 50 split some just gain a load of body weight and they're already in a shitty position physiologically and then they just well they'll they'll change their their position even further by smashing up estrogen and keeping testosterone incredibly low and then they'll feel absolutely horrible as a result of the fluid retention and just the way that they look day to day and then they'll try and diet again and then they'll diet again like four maybe two months three months later um aggressively to try and get off the weight they regain post contest and then they'll just spin their wheels for the rest of the off season that's what happens to a lot of people then you get the other kind of person which is what i did at the end of my last prep which is try and stay too lean because I want to do like the slowest, most meticulous off season ever and reverse diet and add, you know, 25 carb every week and do all of this stupid shit. And also I was training every single day as well because I was just way too motivated and I was, I didn't have a leash on me. No one was controlling that. So it was my idea to do that. And it was a stupid one. So I never really, it took me about six to seven months to recover from my last prep properly because I just, smash myself back into a poor position by accumulating a ton of training fatigue and keeping my calories too low. So what you should do is what me and Cuba are planning to do, which is drop off training fatigue massively by going down to an even lower frequency split. So we're probably going to go to a one-on-one -on -one off split post-show, um, which will be hard because I love training so much, but it will be worth it in the long run. So a one-on-one -on -one off and bring food up enough to gain, I think for me, it will be like a good 10 pounds straight away, like within the first couple of weeks. But then once that 10 pounds is on, then start going slower, not go slow for the first 10 and keep going slow, get 10 on pretty, pretty quick, you know, go out, go out for a few meals, have a few meals, get, get a bit of weight on, um, and then feel better as a result of that, feel back closer to homeostasis and then spend the rest of the time working up your normal diet, your day-to-day -day diet, rest days, training days, um, and bridge that gap. And then I think you can make pretty good improvements in a relatively short span of time um, because you're still lean, 
um, you've recovered some of those those fatigue markers, hopefully, and you've got blood work done, I think you can make improvements. I mean, a great example, I don't know whether you've seen him online at all, but his name's uh, Chris McCready or Keefe, um, Keefe West on uh, on Instagram. He's uh, he's one worth checking out. He's uh, He's a natural that does compete pretty much every year, but every year he comes back a lot bigger. And uh, he's just an advocate of end of end of the prep, get pretty heavy, get strong as fuck, and then stay strong as fuck whilst he diets. And uh, yeah, he's um, he's a monster. So he's um, he's a really good example of how actually you can make pretty good progress if you compete every year as a natural. But I think you've just got to make sure that some of the health markers are there um, in a good spot because otherwise you'll just you'll you, you'll pay the price when you're a little bit older and you might try and want to have kids or something like that. So um, yeah, I think I think that's the the only main consideration outside of uh, making sure that you give it enough time, dependent on where you want to be. So I gave it two years because I wanted to go from a junior to a, a professional men's open athlete. So I needed I needed that time, but hopefully. I hope because I love competing. Hopefully, I won't have to give it that much time again. Hopefully, my next off seasons will be a maximum of a year. Um, I mean, Cuba wants me to compete next year, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, we'll see how this year goes first. So you are not a proponent of the so-called reverse dieting, but just bringing your calories a little bit faster uh, yeah. to get your mind and health uh, back. Yes. Slowly increase as the time goes. Yeah, I think recovery diet is a better term than reverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the focus is on just getting getting yourself back to a good position um, as opposed to slowly trickling that, that surplus in. And the surplus is the thing that you need so desperately. So getting that in quick is so important. So, yeah, that's that. Especially that you won't be able to really, like, know what's your uh, zero or the balance uh, post-competing because yeah. you have grown so muscle and uh you can't really you can't really know because uh we we both are uh, aware of that that sometimes you just add calories and you are even even when you add for example 200 grams of carbs you are still able to drop the weight towards to yeah. go up so uh you have to hurry up especially if you but there is a difference because between as you said gaining faster 10 pounds and then yeah. slowing it down to a let's say to one two to one pound per week or yeah. or even per two weeks uh, or or getting just simply fat because that's what people that's the biggest mistake not only for the natural or for both but for as well the enhanced guys because uh, crossing though this barrier of 12 to 15 percent is just uh, not healthy and not helping you in the progress yeah agreed agreed when it comes to uh, cutting not mm. only to the con uh, contest prep, but uh, as well to the simple cutting. Uh, how yeah. long should it take to a, for a natural athlete? And what are most important aspects of cutting to maintain as much muscle as possible? I think for, for the natural athlete, as much as there are similarities in the whole cutting process um, as there are to assisted, I think we do just need a little bit more time. And this is, this is the reason. So... As a natural, you can't afford to lose super quick, really at any point, because your rate of loss will show in the amount of muscle that you retain. So if I lose much more than 1% of my body weight, um, especially in the latter stages of a prep, I'm going to open up that door to, to muscle loss. And the reality of that is I won't be able to hold performance with a cycle change or with something being added in to retain muscle fullness. Once I'm flat or too flat, there's no going back. There's, there's nothing I can add in for muscle fullness anymore. And I keep, uh, I keep, you know, reminding Cuba of this when, um, when I get a little bit flat, I've got to do something about bringing it back up a, a touch. And he's very good at that. He's very good at spotting my poses when they, they lack pop. And we've only refed twice this whole prep. Um, because I've not gotten flat enough yet to warrant it. So don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those people that says every week, oh, I'm flat, refeed, refeed. I actually hate refeeds. I hate them so much because they confuse me. I don't like them. I just like eating my normal diet. I don't like doing the high days, but if I have to do them, I do them. Um, so 
yeah, the 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 rate of loss needs to be sort of under one percent for the majority of of the prep. So one percent of the body weight, which like my, my start body weight was one hundred and ninety six pounds, so it would be no more than two pounds. And then now it's one hundred and sixty six, so it would be no more than one point six pounds per week at this stage, definitely. Um, and I think again we need a little bit more time because the ability to add any fat loss compounds obviously isn't there so if i'm not where i need to be at four weeks out simple i'm not where i need to be i've just got to make calorie adjustments and i can't just add in something that will bring about pretty quick changes you know obviously when you add in something you know as a fat loss compound you can get pretty quick results out of it um pretty significant shifts in body composition and you know, that's something that I have seen amongst the, the very few clients that I've worked with that are assisted. And obviously I've seen with Cuba's prep as well is that some of the manipulations you can make bring about and yield much quicker changes from a fat loss perspective. Um, and that's something that we just don't have as a tool. Uh, so that's, that's why you need a little bit more time on your hands. And I think besides that, like considerations for the actual diet itself, very similar um elsewhere to to any assisted athlete is the the case of you know even as assisted athletes you don't want to lose too fast because you just affect performance and as much as you can add in things that will protect performance your one of your main drivers is how much weight you lose you know if you lose too too sharply and still you get too flat too stringy your performance is going to go down your muscle retention will be poor no matter what you're you're running so that needs to be a consideration at all times. And um, I think like, I think besides that, that's pretty much like the main thing, to be honest with the, the, the differences. Um, is there anything else on that question that I kind of missed any context that, that any part of that question that I haven't covered? One more thing about the prep and so on. You have to be more uh, meticulous as you yourself said, Okay. Everything, every every aspect, because mm. you know, as you said, we can add, for example, fat burners. We can add something to uh, make that makes us more fuller, faster, of course. Yeah. And uh, so, how much uh, do you take into consideration your sleep, amount of sleep, salt you take daily, uh, water intake, and so on? How, do you yeah. uh, have it all written down? Or just uh, go, do you, you go, because uh, enhanced athletes often forget about things like sleep. They often uh, forget about salt, sodium or so on, uh, water intake. And then uh, yeah. they are, you know, they are. Uh, insane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think it is insane how, how, how some, some people can forget that, especially when, you know, you're doing all of these things to, to enhance your performance through, you know, performance enhancing drugs and you can't manage the basics. That's why I'm so big on people spending time natural because you'll realize how much progress you can make by just ticking the, the sort of the boxes you can tick as a natural athlete. But yeah, I'm very meticulous with those variables. You know, I do track and note down my fluid intake, my sodium, my potassium, my meals are on time every day. My sleep is scheduled. My steps are done at the same time each day. You know, like every, every sort of box that can be sort of managed and com compartmentalized into a little routine, then it is. And I, I think that that is something that, you know, a lot of assisted guys can, can probably learn from is that there are a lot of things that will actually level you up more than taking another 200 milligrams of test or whatever um so you know as much as that might make a difference the the thing is the sleep the meticulous daily tasks they're a bit boring and they're people that like the thing is the results of those things come over a much longer period of time than the results of increasing your performance enhancing drugs so i think a lot of people that aren't serious about bodybuilding aren't serious enough about bodybuilding care only for the things that offer them short-term results than the things that offer them long-term results. So um, as a natural, you've got to play the long game. You, your results will come slower. And I spent two years looking small and soft to now look decent. You know, like when you're in the off season as a natural, you don't look big. You might look a bit bigger in clothing, 
but you swap that for when you diet because when you look a bit bigger in clothing in the off season you then just look small and skinny when you diet so um but uh you you don't you don't look really big you know you just you just sort of carry body fat and the muscles covered up and you know there's very few naturals that look huge in the off season they have to have sort of very elite genetics or, or good body fat distribution i don't look big um i only look big uh when i diet and when i actually show the muscle that i have and when i show the shape that i have so it's a huge game of patience and that's where i think a lot of assisted guys can take notes because obviously the more patient you are with the assisted side of bodybuilding as well the longer you can probably be in the sport and also the benefits of in terms of health ramifications you can mitigate some of those most likely by spending time at lower doses lower dosages that are bringing you results that you don't have to change the, the, the dose yet you know and um i think that's an important thing to to take into perspective is that you know sometimes less is more more is less whatever yeah so that's that the main thing that uh, mm, uh brings us all together either enhanced or a natural guy people need to realize that most of our genetics most sucks yeah. just simply suck we are mostly not made to bodybuild yeah, yeah. Most of people are just not made to bodybuild you everyone can look good but not everyone can be a great bodybuilder and if you take into consideration those things as you said the sleep the salt the, every small aspect and if you keep being patient then the results will show. Of course, you can't uh, think that you're going to um, count your salt every day for uh, two years and you are going to become a Phil Heath because that doesn't happen. Uh, I'm not going to become Kobe Bryant, whatever I do, but uh, it can bring you small percentage, percentage yeah. uh, to the whole picture. Yeah. Uh, do you still take clients? Yes, yeah, I do to an extent. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit like Cuba at the moment. So if if someone comes along that's like, I feel like we can work really well together and as is going to align with my business really well, I'll probably end up making some room. But if I feel like I don't, I, I don't have a lot of space. Basically, I have the space for someone that's really well willing to work hard, and I feel like I can offer them really good value and they can bring me value too then we'll work together but i'm quite selective with who i take on now and that's not me sounding cocky i've spent you know half half a decade working with anyone that comes along you know um but now i can be a little bit more selective so um yeah right now people can apply but um whether or not they get on is dependent on sort of whether i think that it's a good match when are we going to have the next series, uh, next episode of your series on youtube next friday so yeah they're every they're every friday so i'm a friday cuba's a saturday um and i'm one told, whenever. <laughs> yeah so someone told me the other day that apparently having them come out on a friday and a saturday is a bad thing because people go out and i'm like bodybuilders no. don't go out no 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 <laughs> they're, sat, they're sat at home watching our videos <laughs> yeah it's like 5 p.m the best time to add the videos now Yes, uh, so, yeah. yeah, so if anyone wants to get into contact with you, I will link down the uh, Instagram. Thank and you. Uh, I will, of course, link down the, uh, your uh, YouTube channel if anyone is interested. There's lots of knowledge. If you want to keep being natural, then uh, here you have. Here you have the, one of the greatest coaches of in the future as well. And uh, let's hope for the pro natural athlete. Thank you for your time. And uh, have a good one today. How are you training, by the way? Thank you, dude. Uh, no, we're on rest day today. It was legs yesterday, so. Oh, yeah. I have today, is, today is a day of just feeling like we've been hit by a car. No, that's why Kuba is still sleeping. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, have a good one, mate. See you soon, dude. Thank you. Thank you.